Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another edition of The Money Pros. I'm Oliver Tutt, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner, and I'll be your host for the next half hour as we talk about all the issues related to your money, how to make it, how to keep it, hopefully how to help it grow. We've got a lot to get to on today's show. So let me leap in and talk about exactly what we're uh, going to be going through. Uh, first up, we're going to talk about a review of the markets. Now, as this show is being taped, we're about uh, 10 days into the new year, but 2018 was a wild ride, and it certainly finished off with some drama, so we're going to talk about that. In our second segment, we're going to be talking taxes with our tax pro, Greg Picaro, CPA, and partner with our trend of Picaro and Associates. Uh, the new tax law is now in effect, and it was in effect for all of 2018. So uh, preparing your 2018 taxes is going to be an adventure as well. We're going to talk about what you need to know with respect to uh, those changes, stuff we've touched on before, but it's now it's in stone. Now you're, we're talking about it for real. Uh, and the third segment, we're going to uh, ask a question, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, are you middle class? The difference between what people think is middle class and how economists and others define middle class uh, is an interesting conversation, so we're going to get into that in the third segment. So. Uh, having said all that, let's leap into our first segment, which is uh, the stock market for 2018. So uh, let me start off by per putting up a graphic. This is performance for 2018 for uh, three different indexes. Uh, so what you're looking at here is uh, the blue is the Dow, the green is the S&P 500, and the orange is the NASDAQ, and we're looking at it over um, uh, four different time periods. So if we start from left to right, you can see the one month year ending. So this was essentially December. Uh, Dow was down a little over 8% as well as the S&P and uh, NASDAQ was approaching 10% down. If you look at the three month, the numbers were even worse. And of course, the last quarter of 2018 really was bad. Dow was down 12%. Uh, S&P was down uh, uh, 13% and uh, uh, NASDAQ was down nearly 18% just in the fourth quarter alone. And if we go to the, the last column, 2018 year end, because we had such a lousy quarter, uh, it ended up swinging uh, all markets to a negative for the most part. Uh, so we had the Dow down uh, about 6% uh, along with the S&P and NASDAQ was down uh, about 4%. So we ended up with our first negative year since I believe 2015. Uh, but the, the volatility in the um, fourth quarter was really significant particularly as we got toward Christmas time, actually what we saw was a spike in the VIX. We've talked about the VIX here on the show before. We saw uh, maximum volatility uh, on Christmas Eve of all times, uh, just when you're doing your final Christmas shopping, you're watching your retirement plan uh, plunge, always a good time. Uh, so uh, interestingly, another statistic, if you look at the S&P, it hit its high point for the year on October 2nd. Uh, and from there to December 24th, the S&P was actually down 19.6%. That's an important figure because most uh, stock market watchers define a bear market as a 20% decline. So the S&P was just short of a 20% decline uh, from its high in October to its low on Christmas Eve. Another interesting statistic is the S&P is actually since that time up 7.5%. So this year has gotten off to a pretty good start. It's obviously very early, um, but 2018 was marked by a lot of things. We had significant volatility earlier in the year. We recovered from that all the way through the summer into October, and then, of course, uh, the wheels came off the wagon. So a lot of people are asking me, so what are the reasons for this? And you can pick just about uh, any reason you want. Uh, the primary reasons, I think, uh, concern over interest rates is definitely an issue. Uh, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell uh, and his crew have been regularly raising interest rates, which is something that the markets have expected. But as the economy started to hiccup in the fourth quarter, his initial comments suggested that he was going to continue to raise interest rates into uh, 2019, regardless of economic activity. Of course, that made uh, markets nervous. On top of that, President Trump suggested that he wasn't happy with the job uh, that uh, that uh, Chair Powell was doing and that he might look to fire him, which is not actually something he can do. Uh, but later on, Powell indicated that he was going to be more sensitive to the economy with respect to interest rate changes. And he also indicated he would refuse to resign even if President Trump uh, asked him. Of course, markets like stability. So having the same guy in the seat for a little while uh, is probably good news. So we've seen an improvement this year. 2018 was a wild ride. If you haven't looked at your statements, it's probably something you're going to want to do, not for too long, but for a little bit. All right, up next, we're going to talk to 
Greg Picaro, CPA and partner from Atrando Picaro and Associates, about the new tax law changes and what you need to know. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Money Pros. I'm joined now by our tax pro, Greg Picaro, with Atrando Picaro and Associates. Greg. Uh, this is going to be an adventure, right? I mean, we've been thinking about this for, you know, a year plus. We've talked about the changes uh, for 2018, but we've been talking about them throughout 2018, reminding people this didn't apply to 2017. This is going to be for this year. Well, now the time has come, right? Yeah, and I'm not sure adventure is the right word, but... Well, I'm trying to put the nicest spin on it I can, <laughs> right? Um, we were talking about some of our concerns with software and, you know, is the IRS going to be prepared to handle this? You know, right. some of them aren't getting paid right now, so that's an issue. Um, anyway, let's talk about some of the changes that people are most likely to notice. And the reality is the changes are substantial. We don't have nearly enough time to even touch on every single one of them. Um, but one of the interesting changes is the forms, the 1040s, uh, the, the various versions of them that people have come to know and love are not the same 1040s uh, anymore so when they actually look at the forms stuff is going to look different can you talk about that yeah, a little so bit? the first thing we're not going to see the 1040a or ez anymore so those so forms one are form gone. now so we have one form and they've created if you look at the irs.gov you can see the form and all the related schedules but they've created kind of an optical illusion uh, because it looks like you know you, the form looks really simple yep but really it's two pages and why they did this from a you know design perspective? It's basically I, I two half imagine. pages, two half right? Pages. So <laughs> it almost looks like the copy of malfunctioned, right? Um, and it looks simpler than it actually is. So basically, they moved a lot of things that were on 1040 to supplemental schedules, which have additional forms attached to them. So for those that are still out there, actually trying to fill in the blank, so to speak. This is going to be, start early, get acclimated to the form, get the instruction booklet online. It looks bad, but it's really not bad, and there's a lot of good backup schedules in there to help you do the calculations. I'm sure products like TurboTax are going to adapt to this, mm -hmm. and, but be aware, start early, because it's going to look totally different. So. And, and that's really where we have to start is the look is going to be different, so don't right. be thrown off by that, and that's going to affect everybody. If you file a tax return, your return, the document itself is going to look different. Another big thing that, uh, just as, as sort of a, a broad topic area, that's going to affect a lot of people are itemized deductions. And the universe of who is going to be taking itemized deductions versus the standard deduction that the government allows uh, is going to change quite a bit. One of the uh, itemized deductions that people are most familiar with, in fact, in my mind, it's usually the reason people start itemizing, you know, when they're young and they have their first jobs and then they buy a house and they have mortgage interest. Talk to me about how the mortgage interest deduction has evolved. So, so this is going to be a little confusing, and that's why I'm glad we have an opportunity to discuss it. So effective January, generally speaking, of 2018, any mortgage balance in excess of $750,000 for one or two homes, that amount of interest is no longer deductible. That threshold used to be a million. Now, if you happen to be lucky enough to buy your home before, I believe, April 15th of 2018, you're still under the $1 million limit range. Mm -hmm. They provided a... Grandfather, like, Right. So for, well, speak. there's a grandfather for anybody that's already over a million or around a million. And then there was a time period because some people could have been in the process of buying a home late in 17, and then all of a sudden they think they get a mortgage interest deduction that they may not be getting. Okay. So there's a little bit of a window for people who started the process and closed by, I believe it's April 15th of 18, the million-dollar threshold for two homes still qualifies. So when you get your 1098 from the bank, number one, there's going to be a lot more information on that form. They change that. Okay. It's going to tell you what your balance is at the beginning of the year. So the IRS is going to be able to trace whose mortgages are over 750 and whose aren't. What's going to be interesting is for those that are grandfathered, they could deduct all of the interest for the first million, and those that aren't can't. So the government's going to have to distinguish one from the other. So a lot of people are probably saying, hey, $750,000, that's a massive mortgage. Even if I got a vacation home in New Hampshire or something like that, that's still a lot of money. And admittedly, that's going to affect uh, some people. We don't want to discount that. But there are some changes with respect to home equity debt that are also important. Right. right? Similar kind of confusion, right? So home equity interest is no longer deductible unless the home equity was used to purchase a home, repair a home, acquire another home. So there's an ability to take, well, I borrowed this money against my home for $100,000. That was the limit. And I bought a rental property. Well, that interest is deductible as associated with that rental activity. So again, you're going to get a form that's going to have your home equity interest on it. Generally speaking, it's not deductible unless, and if you look at the new Schedule A, there's not a really good way to distinguish it. So my fear is people are going to be deducting home mortgage and uh, equity interest that they may have used to buy a car, consolidate credit cards, and still deduct it 
because they're not able to make that distinction or not thinking about that distinction. But technically, some home equity interest is deductible and some isn't. So I well, want to make sure, that because this is an important takeaway, you might be saying to yourself, geez, I don't have, I don't know $750,000 in mortgage debt, so I don't have to worry about that. But it was common advice just a few years ago. Hey, you want to buy a car? Don't do a car loan. Take it out of your uh, 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 home equity. People were borrowing to pay for vacations, all of these other things. Historically, up to certain limits, some of that interest was deductible. That's out the window at Correct. this point. Correct. All right. So that's a big change I think people need to be aware of, and if they're not comfortable with that, uh, talk to the tax prayer. Another big one that particularly hits home, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, the Northeast, West Coast, um, is uh, we're all familiar with how much we pay in state and local property taxes. Um, I, don't even get me started on the topic, <laughs> but the one bright side was you could deduct it on your federal tax return. Big changes here as well. This is significant. It's caused, as you know, a lot of unrest on both coasts because um, there's a $10,000 limit, period, for all taxes, state income, local property, car tax, all that good stuff, $10,000 limit. Now, the average person, you know, as of 2014, itemized deductions were like 25 grand. So for most people, the 10,000 is not a problem. Of course, if you live in Florida, it's great, right? But here it's going to be a problem. I see very few clients who don't pay more than $10,000 in state and local taxes when you include income tax in there. So it's definitely going to be a big change that's going to affect a lot of people. Um, and that's why some people might be better off, depending on how much they're paying in real estate, not deducting the income tax deducting the sales tax, because at least when you get your tax refund, it's not going to be taxable. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a lot of oddness to that that's going to disrupt a lot of people, and that's why the standard deduction was raised to 24 grand. For so let's talk about this, because here's the dynamic that I think is going to happen for a big segment of the mm. population, which is that because the state and local property taxes are capped at $10,000, and conceivably some of your mortgage interest is not deductible anymore, uh, but even with those two things, you're not going to have as high of an itemized deduction as you've had in the past. You contrast that with what you were just talking about. Standard deduction has gone up. Now people are going to start to elect to take the standard deduction. I think we're going to see more, more of that. I've seen, in fact, I've seen in projections that we've done where, uh, surprisingly, the standard deduction was better than the itemized deductions. So if someone has no mortgage, for example, or a very low mortgage, most likely the standard deduction is going to be the way to go, unless they're big and charitable contributions. So right. if you're very philanthropic, then you may still want to itemize. But I think and people need to, to pay attention to this, particularly if they're not doing their own taxes and they have somebody else doing them and they're just used to keeping track of their medical expenses, keeping track of miscellaneous itemized deductions. Yeah, those are, are out the window, right? too. So all these things out the window, if you start taking a standard deduction, conceivably your return comes quite a bit uh, more straightforward. Your record keeping, you don't have to worry it about as many things. It does simplify in that respect. Um, let's switch off of that and talk about some other notable changes that could impact a lot of people. And one of them is the way uh, alimony is treated for couples uh, that were divorced. And there's some important dates to keep in mind in terms of when the divorce was uh, finalized. But talk to us about the changes and who they impact. Yeah, so this is a, another big deal because certain people will be treated one way and others will be treated another way depending on when they got divorced. So if your divorce was finalized before December 31, 2018, or you were subject to a temporary order for support, so there's another distinction in there too, then you will have deductible alimony, but now, as of now, you will not have deductible alimony. So post December 31, 2018, going into 19, if you had alimony, that was deductible in 18, you get to continue to deduct that. But if you get divorced in February of 2019, even though the ball had been started in 18, you're not going to get an alimony deduction. So you have to negotiate. And we'll say, say the alimony deduction. We're talking about a sp uh, spouses get divorced, one spouse is paying alimony. Old rules were the person paying it got to deduct it. Right. right. And the, other and the person, person receiving it had to claim it as income. Exactly. New rule is it's not a deduction it's and a, it's not and income. And it's not income. So, so we've had several clients who were, we were pushing to finalize their, if they were paying alimony, which not everyone does, sure. trying to get their divorce finalized, or at least to the point we could justify that the, the alimony payment would be still applicable under the old rules, because there are some quirks in the definition of what alimony is, to make sure we had that done, or you have to restructure the payment so that it becomes tax neutral. So alimony, because it was deductible and includable, that was a factor in the negotiation. Last thing I want to talk about, we've probably got about less than 90 seconds, but big changes for 
uh, business owners, and it's in all formats, whether you're sole proprietor or a corporation of some S -corp variety. In right. Um, <clears throat> talk to us about qualified business income and what it means for those. So people. we discuss this on other shows. So hopefully people had seen some of our past episodes. The good news is in the instruction booklet for the inter for the new 1040, there's a one-page worksheet, which is a simplified version of what that deduction will look like. It's a very complicated calculation and situations where people have multiple businesses it definitely that form is not really ideally intended for that but there is a way so if you're a, a small business owner self-employed your income's under $157,000 as a single person you're definitely going to want to be looking for that deduction which is on the second page of the 1040 go to that schedule in the workbook that they provide online and make sure you don't miss it because you're not accustomed to doing it Mm -hmm. It's brand, brand new. You want to make sure it gets in there if you're eligible for it. And there are income thresholds and there are occupation thresholds or, or restrictions. So like doctors, lawyers with high income can't use that. But for most businesses, if the income is under 315000 Well, if you're married, 000, it's 315, right. Uh, you're talking about a significant 20% right off the top deduction in your business Which income could save you a lot That'll of money. That'll help make up for some of the stuff we're losing on the other end. Well, you got to look for the good news where we can. That's but right. the point being, there are a lot of changes, and I'd say we touched on maybe 5% of the stuff that's different. <laughs> and then the detail you get into when you get into it, it's even more significant. Greg, thanks a lot. Look forward to talking to you again and seeing we'll how the see tax how, season yeah, went. We still here, <laughs> still breathing. All right, up next we're going to be talking about middle class and what it is to be middle class. Stay with us. as more to come. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Money Pros. We want to talk about the idea of middle class. Interestingly, uh, for me anyway, we spend a lot of time uh, defining ourselves uh, financially, comparing ourselves to other people. I don't think that that's necessarily a productive endeavor. We'll touch on that a little bit. But one of the ways we define ourselves, and it comes up in political conversations, economic conversations, conversations with clients, is middle class. And who exactly is middle class? So I thought it would be an interesting conversation to touch on. Um, so according to some surveys, and a lot of people look at this, and keep in mind it's defined differently depending on what entity is doing the defining, um, as much as 68 percent of the United States describes themselves economically as middle class. Um, now, one of the organizations that has historically looked into this often is the Pew Research Center. And uh, based on the way Pew defines middle class, and we'll get into that in just a second, uh, Pew indicates that only 50% of the population of the United States qualifies as middle class. Now, um, Pew defines middle class as two-thirds to double, and we're talking about a range here, from two-thirds to double the median national income, uh, which is $57,000. So if you earn between two-thirds of $57,000 and double $57,000, they would define you as middle class. So uh, only about 50% of the United States qualifies with respect uh, to that definition, which I think is interesting when you contrast it compared to the number of people who believe uh, that they're middle class. And there could be a lot of different reasons for that on the higher end, people that make quite a bit more money but still think of themselves very much as middle class, and of course people on the lower end that are aspirational uh, about their finances. The other th interesting thing is um, that that 50 percent who qualify uh, to for middle class based on the way Pew defines it, that's down from 61% in 1971. So based on that two-thirds to double the median national income, that category of people has shrunk 11% uh, since 1971. Um, other interesting statistic about that same idea is that although it shrunk since 1971, most of the decline happened between 1971 and 2011. Since 2011, that 50% figure, 50% qualifying to be in the middle class has remained relatively stable. Uh, so we have a lot of conversations about who is middle class, who qualifies to be middle class. We talk about it with respect to politics. Who's tr going to be benefited by things like the tax laws that we were just talking about uh, in an earlier segment? I think it's important to take some time and consider exactly who these people are and what kind of income uh, we're talking about. I think the other important thing to consider is that it can't just be a factor of uh, you know percentage of the median national income. There are a lot of things, including regional issues uh, and other issues, that affect 
whether a certain amount of income is going to put you in a middle class lifestyle. A good example of that is the size of your family. Let's put up this graphic that I think does a good illustration of that. This is from a website called howmuch.net. And what we're looking at here is three columns, the pink, the green, and the purple. And what they're illustrating is at the top, a one-person household, they would define uh, as middle class as an income range between 34000 and 103000 And you can see that as that green bar is the middle income range. As you step up to two people, that middle class income range goes from 43000 to 131000 As you step up to four people, the range becomes bigger, but the lower end of that range and the higher end shift up dramatically. So a four-person household, now we're talking middle class income ranging from 60500 all the way up to $181,000. So those uh, that's just one example of a dynamic uh, being household size that can dramatically affect whether or not somebody uh, is in the middle class. I think the takeaway message here, though, is you should be aware of these terms as you're listening to various economic conversations in our country, but the reality is it doesn't matter. What you need to pay attention to is your own finances, your own lifestyle, and not compare yourself to the Joneses because generally that's an unhealthy habit. All right, up next we'll show you how you can ask the Money Pros a question. Stay with us. There's more to come. Welcome back to the Money Pros. Do you have a question for one of our Money Pros, me or somebody else you see regularly on the show? There's a way to ask us. Here's the information. First off, you can visit our Facebook page. Uh, search for the Money Pros on Facebook. Like us, obviously. We'd really appreciate that. And feel free to message us or post a question on the Facebook page. Uh, second way is to visit foxprovidence.com. Click on the Money Pros. And then we have a button, Ask the Pros. And those messages will come directly to yours truly. And finally, you can email me, moneypros at foxprovidence.com. We answer all of our questions. And some of the questions we even answer on the air. Don't worry. We'll keep it in Anonymous, but if you have a question, somebody else probably does too. That's it for today's show. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week right here on The Money Pros. Take care, folks.